Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Bradford Baptist Church. So glad to have you all here with us today. <clears throat> I've got a few announcements to announce. Uh, as you know, we are doing the Operation Christmas Child Chris, uh, Christmas boxes. You can pick some up. They're still available, but we will need them here by next Sunday. So if, uh, if you've had one and you've been procrastinating on getting it filled, this is the week to do it. Um, and uh, also, for uh, offering envelopes, you can pick those up in the front foyer. Um, <coughs> there's also a need for uh, some volunteers to help moving Peter and Beth Wukash. They need two or three people to help move some boxes in their house. Uh, you know, so if you'd be interested in helping them out, uh, contact uh, Natalie. Natalie. I, just, I, just, I don't I don't see her here, here yet, yet, but uh, but, uh, but uh, uh, that's so 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 get in touch with her if you can help with that. So, uh, so uh, <coughs> I'm going to read the Psalm, Psalm 19, 19 verses, verses 1 and 4. The heavens the declare the glory of God. God. The, the sky proclaims the work of his hands. hands. Day after day, day, they pour forth speech. speech. You can't night hear it, just faint showing at the bottom. Just, yeah, they have no speech. speech. They use no words. So, we're no getting audio, so. so. Yet their voice goes out into the world. Their words are the ends of the world. In the heavens, heaven, God has pitched a tent for the world. This is yeah, God's word. word. So, uh, so uh, as, 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 as you all know, this is the Sunday closest to Remembrance Day. That's why so many of us are wearing, wearing, wearing this coffee. And so <coughs> I'd, 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 I'd like, like to invite you, you all to stand with me and, and sing, sing okay. our national anthem. Okay. Okay. Canada, our romantic land, true patriot love, in our hearts are we glory in Christ's peace, the true North Star and Eternal, Eternal God, God, save us from resignation to violence. Teach us that restraint is the highest expression of power, that thoughtfulness and tenderness are marks of the strong. Help us to love our enemies, not by countenancing their sins, but by remembering our own. And may we never for a moment forget that they are fed by the same food, hurt by the same weapons, have children for whom they have the same high hopes as we do. Lord, grant us the ability to find joy and strength, not in the strident call to arms, 
but to grasp our fellow creatures in the striving for justice and truth. Amen. <clears throat> you uh, may be seated or you may remain standing for a time of worship. There's lots of times when we feel that the enemy presses in real hard and everybody goes through it, but we have to take courage. The Lord is fighting the battle for us. He'll pull us out of the darkness. We just have to trust in him. Coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. There was shame and break, and broken hearts declare his praise. Who could stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is alive. God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. And every knee will bow before him. So 
power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain, break every chain, break every Break every chain. 
Saul's conversion. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, appeared to you on the road as you coming here, has sent me so that you may see again, filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples of Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's uh, go to prayer together, and I'll just kind of lead on a few items that are in front of us, so let's pray. <coughs> Father, as we come to you this morning, it's, we've sung some very powerful songs that have reminded us of our position and our placement that we have with you. We have a God that cares. We have a God that is powerful. 
We have a God that is intimately aware of our needs and our concerns and our issues. So, Father, just before we move into just praying from some, for some particular needs at this moment, we want to just, as we give you our concerns that weigh on our hearts this morning that we've brought into this room, we want to bring them quietly to you. Hear us as we pray. So, Father, for some of the things that we have brought, we may have brought hurts, concerns. Some are immediate prayer requests because they are fresh in our minds. Some are requests that have lingered for much time. But we have a God that listens. We have a God that hears, a God that is intimately involved with us. So care for us as we ponder as we pray, as we intercede for some of the items that we have on our own hearts and minds this day. Father, we think of some of the needs that are in front of us that we're aware of as a church family, and so we pray that you would continue to care for Peter as he has another week of radiation treatments, navigating, leaving the home each day, down to Toronto, then back, be with him and Beth as they sometimes do it together for the rides that Peter is given by the Cancer Society as they care and help him. We pray for the conversations that Peter has. There are lots of times that he talks about how his faith in Christ is maintaining and caring for him and he can speak life and hope into those that are his drivers, those that he sits beside in the hospital waiting for treatments. May their witness be powerful and strong, even in this trial that they go through. For Gary Swaggerman, as he's going for chemo treatments as well, he knows that this is another mission field that you have invited him to enter into, even though it's dealing with cancer in his body but he knows that the mission field is in front of him, so he wants to be a faithful witness for you. So empower him by your spirit this day. Father, we pray for Paul and Allie Watson as they're grieving today, as Allie's brother passed away on the operation table just two days ago, unable to uh, survive because his body was in so much and had so many complications. But as the family has expressed much peace at this moment, may you sustain them with more of your peace, more of your grace, as they grieve, as they prepare to uh, celebrate his life at a funeral, that you would sustain them as a family and minister to them. Father, we pray for our Sunday school uh, kids right now as they're having their class time downstairs. As Jackie and Dave are part of the teaching team this morning. May they just enjoy talking about the book of Acts and empower them and as the kids listen. May there be nuggets of truth that go deep into their hearts and into their minds. For the work of Awana that has started amongst our churches this past week, already full because we have enough students and enough leaders and the prayer request is that you would establish more leaders so that more kids can come. So, Father, thank you for the gift of being able to care and share the truth of who you are into the lives of these uh, almost 50-some-odd kids that are coming. Father, as we <coughs> also pray for our Portuguese congregation as they're gathering downstairs as well, bless Walter, bless Walter. as he shares the word in spirit and in truth. 
And now, Father, as we turn our hearts to the message this morning from uh, 2 Corinthians 10, we ask now that you would establish spiritual walls of protection around this building. We're getting into an interesting topic about the spiritual battle, spiritual warfare. We have been given spiritual armor. We affirm that we have that armor on us because of Christ. We claim the blood of Jesus over this room, over all of what we are about to do here together as we study your word. We have worshipped, we have prayed, now we study, and then in a few moments we will fellowship. It's all part of a spiritual act of worship. So guide us, direct us, filter the words that I share through the work and the power of the cross of Christ, because for that gift, we have victory over sin and death and the enemy. And for that, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, if you've got your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We've had a bunch of weeks talking about giving, and now a whole brand new segment sort of unleashes and moves into uh, these last four chapters. We're going to see Paul beginning to defend himself because, lo and behold, some people didn't like him. Isn't that interesting? People who love Jesus tend to get the ire of others who don't love Jesus. And it's no surprise because of us going through this study, we know that the opposition is these Judaizers, these false teachers that have come and infiltrated the Corinthian atmosphere. And um, the, the interesting thing is that they're going to go after his character. They don't go after his message. They don't go after the things and his doctrine and his teaching because they are not able to deal with it. So they are now moved to going after his character. It's interesting because the churches and the church in North America has had not the greatest of the last couple of years. Prominent pastors and ministries and denominations have had problems with pastors and their leadership. My dad could tell you the countless times and the countless number of churches that have gone after names because they want them to be in their pulpits, only to find out that after a short tenure of time, they just don't feel it. They're not really driven by that church, and so they move on because it's not what they were hoping for. And so this morning, we're going to get into a believer's mind and will is that is submitted in obedience to Christ's life will walk in victory. Now, don't get confused by the word victory here. Because it can become very easy that we are somehow saying, oh, so everything's going to be great. Recognize the word victory means that we are invited into a battle and we will always be in a battle as spiritual followers of Christ. So it should not be a surprise. Hence the worship songs that were talked about. It's always interesting when you know people's stories. <laughs> and Kathy just wanted to take a moment and just highlighted the third verse and I'm sitting there going, I know what it's been like for her for the last while. And it was a, re it was a revelation to all of us going, wait a minute, that, that verse is speaking deep into her, her heart and her life. Because we will have struggles. Has anybody ever come along and sandbagged you? Throwing you under the bus? And sometimes you just don't know what to say. You don't know how to defend yourself. You don't know how to speak up. You don't know how to respond back. Well, today you get to thank Paul. Paul, I'm glad somebody sandbagged you. Because we're going to learn from him in light of what he went through. But then we can also do a little step back. And we go, wait a minute. If we can thank Paul, then we can thank Jesus, right? Because it's Jesus also 
had a similar experience when suffering at the hands of man for our benefit, for our well-being, for the ability for where we sit here this morning. And how did Paul and how did Christ handle that kind of opposition? You're going to see that there's no vengeance, there's forgiveness. There's no uh, sense of, okay, I'm caving to whatever the well wishes of what humanity wants. Jesus would have not worked well with the woke culture of today. In fact, Jesus saved some of his most stern words and actions, but never being vindictive against the individuals. And so we're going to learn from them and see how they respond. So if you've got your Bible, I'm going to read from the Passion Translation. All right. I've had, I had all kinds of translations in front of me. I, I just got a brand new N.T. Wright's uh, own understanding of the New Testament. Really good. It's really good. So I, I was like, uh, who, which one do I want to pick on this morning? So I, I'm going to read the Passion, then I'll kind of speak out from the NID. So here it is. Now, please listen. Paul speaking to the Corinthians. For I need to address an issue. I'm making this personal appeal to you by the gentleness and self-forgetfulness of Christ. I am the one who is humble and timid when face to face with you, but bold and outspoken when a safe distance away. Now I plead with you that when I come, don't force me to take a hard line with you, which I'm willing to do, by daring to confront those who mistakenly believe that we are living by the standards of the world, not by the Spirit's wisdom and power. For although we live in the natural realm, we don't wage a military campaign employing human weapons, using manipulation, now listen to these words, using manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. We can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture, like prisoners of war, every thought and insist that it bow in obedience to the Anointed One. Since we are armed with such dynamic weaponry, we stand ready to punish any trace of rebellion as soon as you choose complete obedience. Paul's character is now attacked as we see here in this text. <clears throat> First thing that we find out is that he's going to begin to talk about Christ traits or my traits. Sometimes when we get into problems, sometimes when we get into people attacking us, it is an, it's a great opportunity to do one of two things. I'm going off my notes. It's funny. Download happening. Sometimes when we're in the battle, then it is an opportunity by the Lord to sharpen us up, to be, make us to become more Christ-like. Amen? But sometimes when we get brought into problems and trials and testings, it suddenly produces and pull, pops something out of us and go, oh, that's the really ugly side of me. Oh, Jesus, Lord, have mercy. And then it becomes an opportunity for us to go, okay, so there's this something in part of who I am that needs the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. So there's two ways in which we can look at a trial and a testing. And so Paul, as he begins into this text, he starts off with, okay, you want to attack my character? Let me bring the character of Christ to the forefront. All right, so there's Christ, and Paul standing behind him and saying, in essence, if you see Jesus, if you see me, I'm hoping you see Jesus in me. You with me? See what he's doing here? So I had a question, and I think I just inadvertently answered it. <laughs> Why do you think he does this? Because he wants to reveal to them, all along, as I've been in the midst of you Corinthians, I've been modeling Christ. Wow. That's a challenge for all of us. In all of what we say and do, do we model Jesus? Hey, if you're going to knock these traits, 
meekness and gentleness of Paul, which happens to be the character traits of Christ, you're picking on the wrong person here, foolish Jewish leaders. And in fact, don't you find sometimes that when people accuse the accusing finger and say, well, here's what I have, this is what's wrong with Curtis, right? And we do the big finger point. Long scroll. And sometimes, and I've had that, I've had people point the accusing finger, PT, this is what's wrong with you. And, I, and there's times where I would like to say, and I'll say it here, could I start first? Because I think all of us would sit here and readily admit, we are acutely aware of our weaknesses, are we not? We are our own worst critics for the most part. And we could easily sit there and go, <laughs> you only have two things, I got ten, I win. Right? No. So meekness and gentleness. So here's, here's the wording of meekness, because sometimes we think, well, you know, and these are the accusers launching these words out, right? Meekness means strength of spirit that it can endure wrongs done to oneself. You're getting pounded on, but you keep taking it. That's meekness, which really means you have strength. And because you have strength for yourself, you also have the strength to defend others. Jesus cleansed the temple two times. He did it at the beginning of ministry. He did it at the end of ministry. Why? Because he didn't like what they were doing to the way it was affecting the rest of the people. And Jesus stood up in meekness, inner strength, moved forward. All he did was upset tables and move the the animals out of the father's house. Meekness also has the ability to love others over selfishly loving oneself. Gentleness can often be viewed as being timid by the world, <laughs> but gentleness means you're gracious, it means you're patient, you're kind, you're willing to love. And in the book of Matthew 23, which is really kind of interesting, Matthew 23, there's seven woes that Jesus speaks out to the Pharisees. Stern wordings that Jesus saves for the Pharisees because they are the ultimate abusers of the people of God. And Jesus launches into them. And at the very end of it, Jesus then steps back and then he laments for the city of Jerusalem. Oh, you have no idea what you're facing. And I'm weeping for you. I have gentleness for you. He's timid, and yet he's bold. And so these tags have been tagged by the Judaizers, these false teachers. They put it on Paul, and they say, oh, well, when he's in front of you personally, he's timid. But when he's safe at home, on his computer, on Facebook, he can launch into all kinds of tirades and saying, this is what's the matter with you Corinthians. And he seems so very bold. So Paul now says, you know what? You're kind of half right. You're, you kind of are. Paul stated in 1 Corinthians 4, when I came to you, Corinth, the very first time, I came in fear and trembling and weakness, and I wasn't a very great speaker, but I came. And guess who showed up? God. He showed up through my preaching. He showed up through my teaching. And he started changing lives. Even though I was a very weak human vessel, I was very timid, and I didn't seem very bold. And then he launches into verse 2, the first part, I'll be bold if I need to be. But he starts off in, in the NIV, it says, I beg you, please. And what he's doing is Paul's hoping, please, Corinth, get your spiritual house in order. Remember, he's delayed coming to them because he knows that they have a financial gift to take care of. But he's also, now we're also finding out there's another delay. He doesn't want to come and look like, um, what's the word? He doesn't want to look like the strong arm tactic guy. He doesn't want his apostolic authority to come rearing up and looking like he's Mr. Angry Guy. He's saying, take care of the problems. And so he says, I have an expectation, as I expect to be, he knows 
that if he has to be bold, he will be bold to the right people, the ones who have been opposing him, the ones who have been attacking his character, the people that have been swayed by the Judaizers, he'll, I will deal with you. If that's what you want, <laughs> Paul is kind of subtly saying, if you want to fight, I'll bring it. But only if you don't deal with things. So Paul says, I can be bold face to face if, that, if that's what is necessary. I don't have to hide behind a piece of paper and a pen. But he's been accused here in the latter part of verse 2 is that he's been accused of following worldly standards. Paul, you're just like, and again, here's what happens when people accuse you. Sometimes when people are accusing you, the very things that they're accusing, so imagine I'm picking on Curtis, which I'm doing right now, um, but in a hypo hypothetical way. Uh, and I'm accusing P Curtis of, well, you're, you're this and you're that and you're this and you're that. And sometimes I've seen that the very thing that the person's accusing you of is the very thing that they're guilty of. See, when you're wallowed up in sin, you can easily spot it in other people. May or may not be accurate. So what we're finding out here is these who are accusing Paul, you're suddenly going, these guys, they're struggling. This is exactly the way they do ministry. This is the way they're doing life because they're tied into the world system because they're selfish, they're self-seeking, they're proud, and they are opposing anything that has to do with the fruit and the work and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. But Paul's got it. So, uh, oh, no, where did my Romans passage go? It's not there. Oh, shoot. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform any longer to the standards of the world, but let your minds be transformed by the presence of the Christ so that you will know and do the perfect will of God. One of my commentators, Dr. Roy Lauren, says this. They attacked his appearance. They attacked his genuine Christian character. It's why Paul says, look at Christ and then look at me. I've al I was always bugged by Paul in my early days, teen years and early 20s, and I was like, man, Paul, you always sound so arrogant. Right? It's interesting, right? Until you suddenly really do a deeper dive into the life of Paul and you suddenly go, Paul was always saying, Look to Jesus, and if you see Jesus, I hope you see Jesus in me too, which should be all of us. And now he goes into the strategy in verses 3, 4, and 5. So, folks, you've got somebody who's sandbagging you. You've got people who are coming after you. Here are the things that we can do. One. There's it. There's Romans 12. It was a little later. Okay, we fight a very different battle. It's a battle that's not part of this world. Even though the people that are going to be fighting you are going to be fighting for within the world's earthly system, but Paul is saying, no, 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 ladies and gentlemen. No, 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 Corinth. This battle is a spiritual one. For those of you who were here last week, especially if you were here right at 10 o'clock, we had an interesting guest show up. You remember? The alarm? None of us were distracted by the alarm, were we? We all sat here and we just listened to Curtis and we had no problems with the dinging and dinging and dinging and dinging. None of you noticed that PT got up and left the room because he had to go and wag his finger at whoever caused the problem and say, come on, what's going on? I didn't. Curtis did a very brilliant thing, which I missed because I was out there trying to help the group that was trying to figure out why in the world is the alarm going off. Curtis knew, and he prayed, if the enemy is trying to cause a disruption, distraction, or distortion of what's going on here, shut it down now. Brilliant. Brilliant. Because I've been in services when I should have been alert the enemy's here, and he's doing his best to stop us. And sometimes I have to have other people who send me, send me a piece of PT. I think the enemy's really trying to distract. Oh. Yeah, you're right. So 
So Paul knows that this is a battle within the spiritual realm. And who's in the spiritual realm? It's Satan. It's his demonic minions. It's errors. It's falsehoods. It's the critics. It's the people who are being used by the enemy. Keep that in mind here. And we have critics who are trying to take out Paul, but Paul is able to step back and go, I know who's manipulating these guys. It's the enemy. It's a bigger it's a bigger battle. It's not the world system. Yes, they're using the world system, but it's the, whole, it's the enemy that's coming against us. And Paul knows where the battle begins, and he knows where it ends, and it's all in the spiritual realm. And so we need to be aware that, yes, we live in the flesh, as he says here in verse 3. We live in this world. We're stuck. Lenski says this, they can use trickery, these are the Judaizers, they can be underhanded, they will vilify, they will slander Paul, and Paul will be crushed. But because Paul is a seasoned warrior, he's calling out their bluff, so to speak. How so? Well, he says it in verse 4. He says, we have divine weapons. Now, some commentators have a habit of sometimes saying, well, this is Paul and his team, and I, and I always think that's a little bit limited, isn't it? Because I think Paul is now challenging the church family and saying, we, we, collective, you, all of you. Because it isn't always pastors that are all spiritually strong in the Lord. Or not. We are. What are the weapons that Paul is referencing here? Well, we have Ephesians 6. Stand firm then with the belt of truth, right? Buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness, not our righteousness, but whose righteousness? Christ's righteousness, right? <clears throat> and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of warfare, anger, accusation, the accusing finger. Does it say that? What does it say? Peace. Ah, oh, Paul, this isn't the way we fight battles in the world, right? Because you get on Facebook and Facebook and you send off an angry little text to somebody. That's the way we do it. We're not supposed to be peaceful people. Paul says we are. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit. Paul saying, if you want to fight with me, here's what you're going to be fighting against. Just like the story of King Saul trying to give David the armor, his armor, and saying, here, David, put this on to go fight Goliath. And David puts it all on. He says, no, 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 no. This isn't the way we're doing it. I'm fighting the way God wants me to fight. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the way we need to be thinking here this morning. When you're in battles, you're fighting a spiritual battle. Keep that in mind. And if it's a spiritual battle, then you're going to go in, going and being led by the Holy Spirit. And there's other battles, there's other weapons that we have. We have evangelism, we have discipleship, we have worship. These are all unique tools that God has given to us in order to defeat the flesh. So now we get into it. So the latter part of verse 4 talks about a power encounter. When someone chooses to resist or fight God, you're encountering God and his military power and prowess. Paul's probably writing here with a little bit of a smirk on his face. These Judaizers think they got it in the bag. They're going to come and they're going to defeat God. They can defeat him and they can overcome him. And you know what? Paul's writing and he's going, well, I tried that once. It didn't work out so good for me. Three centuries later, after this letter is written, all of Rome has now been flipped upside down, no longer paying allegiance to Caesar or emperor, but to the Lord Jesus Christ. Woo. God's tools can take down strongholds, as it says here. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Is your family resisting Christ? Paul says it can, come, it can deal with it. Is your city resisting Christ? 
it can come down. Is your nation resisting Christ? Yes. The world? Yes. Next Sunday, we're going to pray for the persecuted church. Technically, it was supposed to be today, but it kind of conflicts with uh, Remembrance Day. But next week, we will, and we will be praying for some of the countries that are still saying, we're going to fight God. Dr. Lauren says this, with these weapons of the Spirit, he could raise mighty strongholds. He could conquer formidable enemies. He could blast away bitter opposition. He could destroy evil influences. Do you realize the potential power of God within you? And how easy is it for all of us to somehow we face a crisis and we want to go back to the world's way of fighting instead of going, wait a minute, God, 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 reorientate me. This is a battle that's in the spiritual realm. And so 2 Timothy 1 says, we have not been given a spirit of fear or timidity, but a spirit of power, love, and sound mind. All kinds of great verses that come into play when it talks about spiritual battles. And so these verses now are giving us promises, folks. These are promises. If you've got a hardcore Bible, you can underline and start writing in and saying, promises. This isn't just kind of like, well, you know, if you do this and you do, th no, promises. First part of verse 5. So we've got a power encounter, now we get to the truth encounter. The, um, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. So in the book of Acts, there's loads of examples of the, ap the apostles sharing the truth of the gospel, people listening, people being converted, people saying, I want to hear more, even people resisting and fighting back. But Paul is not saying he fights on his own. He's saying, I fight with these weapons. I fight with a dependence on the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. I'm fighting this battle with my team, the church. Amazing to realize that preaching and teaching can demolish fancy human systems of thought and ideas. The proud arguments that are being projected, trying to be projected up against God's word. And so these proud thoughts, these reasonings of man, want to resist the gospel, and all they want to do is build up the flesh of man because sin always resists God. Sin wants its own way. Sin does not want to glorify God, but the flesh, the, pe the people who believe in the flesh believe a lie, and they are held captive in their own tombs. And God's truth can set prisoners free, which leads to the next part, is that when a power encounter and a truth encounter come into play and it begins to affect a person's life, then their allegiance shifts from their self and their flesh, and they believe in Jesus Christ, who is the true freedom fighter. The old life gets demolished because a gentle Savior is standing in the wings, ready to welcome the sinner home. A new captive mind and will submits to the obedience of Christ and suddenly goes, oh man, it's so much better when I follow Jesus. Life goes so much better. Because when I did it in the flesh, I had problem after problem after problem. A new captive mind will no longer say, I'm not going there, God. Sometimes we do. But it'll say, I want to try and obey you, God. <laughs> think, of Jesus, think of Paul on his journey to Damascus Road. He's on his horse. Light comes, boom, off his horse, on the ground, power encounter. Now he's lying on his butt, and he's blind. See the power? And now the truth. Jesus holds him captive for a 45-minute long message, pounding away at him. No, actually, he didn't. Probably took like 20 seconds. Who do you think you're messing with? You're persecuting me. What? Truth encounter. And then for three days, he has to sit somewhere, blind as a bat, and all he does is think. And think and think and think and think. Acts doesn't tell us all of the further downloads that maybe the Holy Spirit was suddenly launching into him at, during that time. We don't know. Nothing's told. All we're left with is just this crazy encounter. But three days later, Ananias shows up and says, I'm here to pray for you. 
scales come off, and Paul says, I'm all in. Allegiance. Encounter. He leaves the flesh and moves to Christ. Oh, and then we get told, oh, by the way, he suddenly starts preaching. What? And then he eventually goes away for a period, a long period of time, reorientates himself and comes back ready to go after his arch enemies, the Gentiles. <laughs> Obedience to Christ and Christ alone. So let's look at the latter part of verse 6, because it's kind of interesting the way Paul writes it. If you get your obedience to Christ settled, Corinth, and Christ alone, be loyal to Christ alone. Paul wants them to get their spiritual house in order before he arrives, get the Judaizers out, and whoever has been fooled by them, then hopefully they get straightened out. If I have to come and be bold with them, I'll be bold with them. 6a, we can deal with the acts of disobedience. It's not stated how he's going to do it or who's going to be doing it, but verse 6b has happened. If it has happened, they have been spiritually sold out here in Corinth, then the land has been invaded. See, the Romans, when they would come and they would take over a country, then the big army would move out and then a little army would remain. And they would be there to just deal with the little pockets of rebellion. And that's kind of the imagery that Paul is putting into play here. Nobody is forced to be a lead having an allegiance to Christ. They're held captive to Christ because they suddenly go, my mind has changed. Oh, what was I thinking when I was resisting Christ all this time? You are too good to be true. I'm all sold in. Okay, application, bring it home. One, church. All right, folks, we need to be spiritually alert and be spiritually aware. We are in a spiritual battle. Now, that doesn't mean we're always sitting here looking around. Oh, there's Satan. I knew he was there, all right? So, but we're alert, we're aware. And we need to be that way. We don't need to be complacent. So, <laughs> I'm coming here this morning, I happen to be listening to a news station, and they were talking about what's going on, what has been going on in China for the last 10 years amongst the millennials. Folks, I, I just was like, wow, this is amazing. The millennials have become complacent to the communist system. Do you now know, and you don't know because most media is not telling us this, China is begging the young people to have babies. Do you now, I didn't know this. They're now begging you to have three children. And you know what the millennials are doing? Nada. And the communists know they are years away from the whole system collapsing because they are saying, we're not going to work. We're not going to become doctors. We're not going to become engineers. We're just happy to be just low-lying fruit. And the communist leaders are panicking. Hmm. So church, lesson, let's not be complacent. What has COVID done for some believers? It's made us complacent. It's made us lax back and say, you know what? I'm just going to sit around and do a whole lot of nothing. Things are starting to open up. Things are starting to change. And now we're having to, we, we've maybe been given a nice break from, from the Lord. But now we're needing to start thinking, okay, how do we how do, we do evangelism? How are, we're having to do evangelism very differently now. And so we're needing to think and be aware. So let's be alert as a church family. Now personally. Be alert to the enemy because he's a roaring lion. Be alert to the fact that we need each other. We need one another in this room. And for those who are sitting at home on Zoom, we need one another. It scares me when I'm finding out about people who are just choosing to say, I'm going to not bother with the church, not BBC, just church, and I'm just going to do it on my own. It's not the way Christ is meant it to be. You're going to be picked off by a roaring lion. We need one another. Know your armor. Back to Ephesians. There's so much more we could say on all of that. Know that you have truth. Know that you have power. Know that you have allegiance. 
Be aware of the lies of the enemy that want to sabotage God's truth. Ask God to deal with it. If a lie comes, if a statement is in your head, you need to put it out. Put it on a piece of paper so you can see it and go, Jesus, is there any truth in this? If it's not, then you hold it captive. Take it to the cross. Dispense the lie at the cross. Embrace the truth. That's oftentimes what I do with a lot of my healing ministry and the counseling ministry is that we isolate the lie and then we embrace the truth. And that is what we take to the cross. When we hold on to the cross, literally, and say, I'm believing this. This is who I am in Christ. <sighs> wow. Well, I got a little jacked up this morning. Yeah, it's, it's a topic that I'm, I'm very much a part of. But I forget sometimes. Sometimes I forget I'm in the battle. Sometimes I need you, the body, that says, Hey, PT, I'm just wondering, I think this may be a spiritual warfare. What? Really? Oh. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. See? We need each other. Look around. Just look around. I need you. I need you. And I need you, and I need you, and I need you, and I need you. And I need sometimes the baby Christians who sometimes see things with such clarity that us old farts in the Lord <laughs> miss. <laughs> and we do. We do. We need each other. Boy, do we need each other. November 7th, we need each other. Thank you, Jesus. We need each other. We need you, Jesus, more than we need anything else this world could offer. We need you. Jesus, thank you for BBC, for all of its imperfections but for all of its good that you have instilled into it, for all of the things that you have invested in us, we say thank you. Yeah, we can easily poke holes in where we struggle and where we have our problems. And those critics could easily come to me and I could say, well, here, here's where you're probably going to pick us off on. But help us to keep focusing in on the things that you want us to focus in on, not what the world or not what the church down the street is doing, but what you, shepherd of this flock, say about this church. Especially when you look at the seven churches in the, in the book of Revelation. Everybody had their strengths, but nobody was the same. We have our strengths. Keep us strong. Keep us guarded. Keep us alert. And keep us dependent on you, Jesus, and dependent on one another. We need each other. We need each other because, baby, there is a battle out there. But you have won the victory. By your blood shed on a cross, you have set captives free. And the captives who are sitting here this morning are saying, thank you, Jesus. And now we pray for those who are caught in the world's fleshly system. Help us, partnered with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, help us to be the, your agents of seeing their lives being changed for Christ. Amen? Amen. Wow. Thank you. What a great morning. What a great morning. Enjoy fellowship. Thank you, Jesus. You gave us another sunny day to stand outside and talk. All right? Bless you, bless you, bless you. Do we need each other? Yes, we do. All right. Have a great morning.